Hello, welcome to Sri Lanka 2048, where we talk about creating a more sustainable, livable future for all of us in Sri Lanka. These days we are hearing much about climate change. The climate apparently is changing faster than it has been, and this is creating a lot of problems for humanity and all the other living beings and living systems on this planet. Today we want to talk about living with climate change rather than looking back and asking who or what has brought us here. And to do that, we have in our studio scientists, economists, and, and other experts. And in this, on this side of the studio, we have an audience from government, from civil society, and private sector who are all interested and engaged in this topic in one way or another. So let me, let me start off with the panel asking each of you to tell us from your perspective, assuming and accepting that there is a climate crisis, where do we go from now and where are we today? Now, uh, it is a global problem, that's why we are talking about it, not only affecting Sri Lanka. So the main uh, focus here is actually due to man-made things, or you know, emitting more and more gases into the atmosphere, which are called greenhouse gases, which leads to warming of the globe, creating uh, weather-related, climate-related problems. So therefore, we need to focus and see how, in order to you know, manage ourselves, you know, live in this world together, globally, we need to come together and see what we could do. So the basic thing is, I, as I see, is to do our things so that we will not exceed the limit that is there in the atmosphere, these so-called greenhouse gases. Uh, uh, excuse me, how do we know the limits? I mean, this is, this is an open-ended experiment. Yeah. And, and how do we even begin to guess what these limits are? Yeah. Now, uh, scientists have said, of course, we need this so-called carbon dioxide, for example. It contributes about 60% of the uh, global warming which is, of course, uh, increasing now in a very rapid rate. Of course, there are other gases. Now, of course, you know, we cannot live without them. They are all natural gases. See, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, all are natural. So, we need them. Only thing is that we shouldn't go beyond a certain limit. Now, the, to answer the question, if, from the history, we know that we were living comfortably maybe 100 years ago, pre-industrial, so-called pre-industrial era. So we know by now the amount of carbon dioxide that was there during that time. And now it is increasing. So the tolerable or the limit that we should focus is the time that we didn't have this much so-called development industries putting out a lot of gases. So therefore, of course, inter globally now international agreements are there to reduce this emission to a level that was there in 1990 even lower than that would be beneficial, but at least try to limit to the time that, you know, 1990 level, 1990 level, meaning that during 1990, how much went into the atmosphere. Dr. Bhattagoda, is this all a lot of hot air or is there solid science behind all this? Definitely, yes. Now, in the past, uh, what was happening is the climate change was uh, some, sort of, uh, some doubt about climate change. Now there are no, no issue about the certainty of climate change. The scientist says uh, 100 years ago, uh, the atmosphere carbon dioxide concentration was 270 parts per million. Now it's becoming about 370 parts per million. If we continue like this trend, it will in 100 years later, it will be about 570 parts per million in the atmosphere. So this uh, is the problem. So we have now uh, understood clearly scientifically uh, in 100 years time, our atmospheric temperature will go uh, or increase by around 1 degree to 5.8 degrees uh, centigrade. So if this happened, definitely uh, scientists also predicted that our sea level rise will go up to at least as much as like uh, 90 centi, uh, centimeter, centimeters. So this is actually a problem. You look at the Sri Lankan uh, scale. So, according to these scientific uh, findings, uh, Sri Lankan average temperature will increase by in 100 years about 5 degree possibly. And also if assuming uh, uh, sea level rise increase about uh, uh, 90 centimeters, 
So, large area of our coastal belt will be undergo uh, in the sea. So, this will affect our agriculture, this will affect our industries, a tea sector, our power sector and all range of sectors. So, what is to be done? So, we rather than uh, talking about whether climate change is certain or uncertain, so we have to ready for it. So, what the two thing we should do is either we adapt ourselves, we must ready for it, we have to change our lifestyle to face this problem and do some mitigation action as much as possible in a little way. Mitigation means? Mitigation means, you know, we know the climate change is due to the concentration of uh, greenhouse concentration uh, gases in the atmosphere. So, we have to, as much as possible, we must try to reduce our, uh, our part of the emission. For example, we can switch off our light as much as possible. We can use a very more efficient air conditioner. We should use more uh, high efficient vehicles and so on and so forth. And then we can, uh, we can close to a water pipe. You know, we, knew, uh, we have a running water pipe all the time. That means you are emitting, uh, I mean, uh, gases in the atmosphere. So, as, as much as possible, you must try to uh, minimize use of uh, your energy and your chain lifestyle, which is not uh, impacting to the atmosphere very much. There is certainly something every one of us can do, and we'll come back to that uh, towards the end of our panel. Ray, I know you as a tropical farmer who worships the sun. Isn't everything begins, uh, doesn't everything begin and end with the sun? Yes. Now, look, uh, I'm concerned not so much with global warming as with global dimming. Now, we are blessed with year-round sunshine in the, in the tropics. Should have a lush vegetation. Instead, now these due to the pollution that we have imported and, and which through incomplete combustion on the roads is, is forming aerosols in the air. As a result of that, there is an umbrella over the country, over the whole part here, which stops the sunshine getting through. So we are getting what's called um, global dimming. And the, we should get up at least uh, 17 megajoules of sunshine per day. Now, in the last few years, we've had crops declining, um, paddy declined, coconuts declined. People blame, blame in, insufficient rainfall. No. It is a cloud cover without rainfall, but it intercepts the, the photosynthesis. And the photosynthesis is what is vital for our crops. Explain to us photosynthesis very quickly. Okay. Photosynthesis, Nanaka, is the, the flow of energy from the leaves into the fruit, either in from, from, the, from the leaves into the, uh, um, the, the in rice, the, 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 the filling grains, and that occurs the last 20 days before harvesting. And in coconuts, for example, the whole year, the whole previous year, must have at least 16 to 17 megajoules per day, adequate sunshine for the starches to flow from the leaves into the fruit. That is what has been cut down now. That is why our yields have been low. Not fertilizer, not water, but insufficient sunshine. So this is adding to the food crisis that we yes. are experiencing right now. And, and climate change is going to aggravate these things. We can do something about that. Okay. And we are doing something about that. We'll hear more about it uh, okay, in the fine. coming rounds. Darshini, as a marine biologist on the, on the panel, we heard about sea levels rising and, and we being an island nation, should we worry? We should definitely worry as uh, Dr. Bhattagoda was explaining. Uh, if the water level actually comes to 90 uh, centimeters, it's, it's going to cover a vast area, uh, low-lying areas around the country itself, and most of the northern area will be underwater, and most of our agriculture is happening in that area. So it will have a lot of cascading effects, and our cities are also in the coastal regions. Our main industrial uh, activities are happening in the coast. So a lot of disruption is going to take place. And, uh, and it's important to look at this entire thing. It's, it's not just an environmental issue anymore. It's actually a development problem. So recognizing that climate change is a development problem will help us to uh, go into the risk management to some degree. That's how our path should be made. Thank you. 
Uh, as we heard, climate change is not just an environmental concern anymore. It has become political, certainly at international level. It has become a security concern and it has become an economic concern. Uh, when we come back after this short break, we will explore some of these aspects and, and we will have some of you joining us from the audience. Let us take a short break now. Today we are talking about living with climate change. Energy is a key component when we discuss climate change. And clearly, we all seem to be addicted to oil. At the same time, there are thousands of Sri Lankans who have found their own sustainable energy solutions. Let us take a look at this video where we profile some of these. Climate change has given new impetus to renewable energy sources such as solar, wind and hydropower. These enable us to generate electricity without producing carbon dioxide that warms up the planet. Savolbaya Economic Enterprise Development Services, known as SEEDS, uses hydro and solar power to help rural people meet their energy needs. This village in Kegul district is too far from the nearest road for it to connect to the national electricity grid. But they have a fast flowing stream with enough of a drop to generate electricity for the whole village using micro hydro. <laughs> The power comes from this turbine direct to each home. But not every village has a stream. For them, tapping into the sun is the answer. Up to mid-2007, Seeds has helped over 64,000 families to install solar home systems. As with Hydro, Seeds provides loans to cover insulation costs. Each month, a rep comes to collect loan repayments and check the system. This farmer uses solar energy to light up his home and also to power an electric fence that protects his crop from wild elephants. Renewable energy is gaining ground in towns as well. This barbershop is connected to the grid, but its owner prefers to run on solar. Can making that's what I call true independence. Can one of you tell me what is the total energy picture in Sri Lanka like today? How much are we relying on on imported expensive oil when we look at the totality of energy used in the country? In Sri Lankan uh, context, if you look at it today, uh, like, uh, we are importing around uh, uh, 2,100 million uh, litres of uh, diesel, basically out of which about 18% uh, goes for power generation. If you look at the total uh, power generation picture, about 65% uh, of uh, power now generated producing the thermal sources. Thermal sources mean the sorry, furnace oil or diesel. Only 35% uh, come from the hydro. So that means we are, we are burning a lot of uh, fossil fuel which contribute to climate change. Basically. But what about biomass? If you take the totality of all energies, including but not limited to commercial energies, doesn't that picture change then? Yes. Um, Dr. Bhattagoda, you, you brought up the, uh, the, the gigawatt hours used. Well, this is mainly for electricity. Exactly. Yes. Now, uh, we've all been misled by these electricity figures, and we know that uh, hydropower is only 20% of that now. 
and all, all the, the, the rest is imported. Who pays for it? Who pays for it? I'll tell you. The tea industry all goes in for, to pay for imported oil. The rubber industry, the coconut industry, all goes for imported oil. Who pays all the other expenses in the country? You know who? Our armies who are going abroad and working as slave labor. That fund is now being wasted here on riotous living. Well, what, to, what to do? What's the alternative? What is the alternative? Good, good question. We can grow all our energy here. And not only our energy, but also our fertility. The fertility and the, and the energy come side by side, hand in hand. You can, can't look only at energy and look at fertility. You want fertilizers here, you want energy here. It's the combination of the two. My suggestion to the country is that we, you know, the, even the cities, like the Baba who was saying, cities, you know, who can make a solar cell, who can afford a solar cell, put up a solar cell. And then, during daytime, probably he is not using, he is not at home, he is working somewhere else. So, you can connect that to the grid. You supply to the grid during daytime, nighttime you come back and take it from the grid. Because daytime, this country, 200, 365 days, 12 hours, we have sunshine. And why not we tap that? You know, we, I have some experience in mid latitudes, high latitudes, they are doing that. But I understand that it is tricky when it comes to supplying a private generator of electricity supplying to the, to the national grid. There are some, some hurdles, some bottlenecks. Would anyone in the audience have experience with, with that? So the mechanism uh, that Dr. Sumatpala mentioned is actually called net metering. Uh, although CEB does not provide provision for that as per uh, this current moment, there are places that the system can work and does work. And, and some of them are the large industrial zones that's run in, in the country where the, the, there is a mini grid that is operated by the industrial zone. Give and, us an example, please. Uh, MAS Fabric Park at Tulhiria where there is a factory which has a, um, a large solar panel installation and it does use net metering where the, when the factory is not working, the power that's generated is used internally. Um, but there's also um, uh, another point that I would like to bring up again. As Dr. Vijayavadana mentioned in his opening remarks, the issue of pollution and the cloud cover, as well as um, what's actually happening with climate change as well, does have an impact on our ability to generate solar power also. So that is also one concern and we need to think about that as well. Thank you. Any quick response? Can we, can we also bring in the, this whole subject of biofuels, ethanol, that the world is talking about? It's controversial. Dr. Yeah. Sumatipal. Yeah, actually that is another way that we need to think of, you know. For example, Brazil, for example, they are, you know, the, the fuel cost is a main, mainly from the sugarcane industry that's coming out of ethanol. You know, they are, you know, if you go to that country, everywhere, like petrol sheds, they have this ethanol sheds all the way. How does it work? Do it, we mix ethanol into you know, gasoline? It, uh, no, I mean, hybrid they started with, you know, the mixing. But uh, they have more or less 90 percent, over 90 percent is ethanol now. You know, uh, so they, they, they have big sugar uh, cane industry and they produce sugar and this comes as a byproduct. And that, that's a win-win situation actually. But Brazil is a much larger country. That's right. Okay. Do we have the land in this country to grow food, have our human habitats and also support biofuels? Anyone? Yes, Ray. Yes, we have the land. But we should not invade arable land. Sugarcane land <coughs> should not be invaded for biofuels. Uh, we have <coughs> ample dry zone land, uh, land in the wet zone too, all over the country, which is superb for biofuels. But the type that you that you use to, to burn, you do, you don't you don't. Um, Try to try to make a, a, a liquid fuel out of it. By efficiently burning that fuel, you can gasify it. And we are showing, because we have so much insulation here over the ground, if we can make use of it, that are in the canyon garden, they make beautiful use of it. They in, 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 in several layers of, of photosynthesis, complementary, 
in the coconut area, we can go the same. We are going the same. With the upper area picking up, uh, uh, co the coconut picking up all the light available, the next canopy layer of glaciaria, the next canopy layer of, of titonia, and then the cover crop layer, all feeding the soil organism. You can meet your full requirement of energy and fertility without any imports. And you've done your calculation, I We understand. can do it, and we're showing it all the time. We get crowds of people coming to see. Where? It's at uh, my little place called at Kalkapalio. And the, 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 the curse is, we got so many people coming there, that we have to, well, are you going to do this? Nah, they can't balandava. It's a bloody nuisance, those people. So, so you have it working there for all skeptics to see. We have a question here, Vishaka. Well, uh, what, what I would want to say was we have, we have so much of uh, discussions, interest, uh, talking about biofuels, but what we have found recently is that we don't know enough about it. When we started actually looking at it, we don't know what are the, what are the crops we have, we don't know the yields, we don't know the energy that is generated from, from those yields. There are general information available in the world, and for Sri Lanka, we don't have specific enough information. So all I'm trying to say is there it is time for us to start working on it and get some real data uh, and, and to share it. Because people who may have data are definitely not willing to share it at the moment. If you permit me, I would like to highlight another issue related to energy, which is to do with the way our attitude towards energy, the conservation the way we feel that in Sri Lanka we, we have to have maximum amount of energy to make us all happy. Look at our buildings. Look at the way we are using lights in the buildings. Look at the way we design our buildings. So it's really up to us and the designers of buildings and occupants of those buildings to be more energy conscious and, and to aim for conservation. Yeah, That's what you're saying. Yes, I think for some reason we have decided it may be 20, 30 years ago, that we need to change our building style. And we have copied Western type of buildings for the sake of, you know, being seen as a, I don't know the reason, but probably for some reason we want to become, be seen as a Western country and copy those buildings that are not necessarily suitable for our climate. When we come back, we talk about another aspect of living with climate change. Let's take a short break now. Everyone is talking about carbon these days, low carbon lifestyles, carbon neutrality and so on. What does it, all this mean and what are the emerging carbon markets? We want to look at that during this round, but first, here's a quick introduction to what carbon trading is and how small groups in India are trying to relate to the global carbon markets. As a result of the Kyoto Climate Summit in 1997, the Kyoto Protocol established the Clean Development Mechanism, or CDM. This is a global framework for trading in greenhouse gas emissions. So how does this trading take place? Say Factory X emits 500 tonnes of carbon dioxide every year. But under the Kyoto Agreement, the factory is in fact only allowed to emit 300 tonnes. If it exceeds this, it has two choices. Either pay a hefty fine or offset its own excess emissions by paying another company, which can prove that it has cut its emissions to below the set target. Developing countries which have signed the Kyoto Agreement do not have to limit their emissions. However, if a factory in such a country can show that it has measurably reduced its greenhouse gas emissions, this amount can be sold to an excessive polluter in the developed world. This is called a carbon credit. Most of the CDM credits are generated in developing countries by heavy industries like this one. But the process is a complex mix of accounting and science. Small-scale projects and community groups 
find it hard to pay for the costly accreditation process. So a voluntary informal trade in an emission reduction has sprung up outside the official CDM process to cater for this small and distributed market. Emmanuel de Silva is a specialist in microeconomics. He has kick-started a biodiesel business near Hyderabad in northern India. He gets money for the villagers through this voluntary carbon offset market. It's a business driven by concern for the environment. We have people from all over the world. We have contributors from the United States, from the United Kingdom, uh, from Australia. But most importantly, a lot of the contributors are Indians. And these are concerned people, concerned about the environment. And they say, why can't we contribute too towards the cleaning up of our own country? The village of Rawalpilli produces biodiesel using oil from the Pongamia tree. And you can use this oil for multiple purposes, from producing electricity in the village, to pumping groundwater, to even running some farm equipment. The benefits for villagers don't stop with emissions reductions, because the surplus oil and oil cake, used as fertilizer, also generate income. For the villagers, the money from offsets is an incentive to keep tending the trees for seven years before harvesting the fruit that gives them the oil to run the generators. We learned that by planting these trees, you can get oil to produce electricity. In the future, our children can read because of the electricity. The people say, let's go to the forest and collect pongamia seeds, bring them back to the village, and then we can get electricity. The people associate the trees with biodiesel. Complex science and accounts in carbon trading. Can I ask you, Dr. Bhattagoda, what niche can Sri Lanka find in the growing carbon market around the world? In fact, Sri Lanka has been a little bit behind this whole business. But at the moment now, with the establishment of uh, Sri Lankan Carbon Fund Limited uh, as a joint venture by the private sector and government, now we are a little bit pushing a little bit uh, forward. Now, so far, uh, Sri Lanka, have, we have about around 50 uh, carbon credit projects offset, uh, including mostly the power sector. And uh, five projects has been completed, which uh, generate about 180,000 tons of carbon and we have estimated Sri Lanka has the potential to uh, generate around uh, 3 million tons of uh, carbon credit uh, annually. In, in, in current market rates, what does it mean in, in rupees in the, or dollars? In dollars mean actually at the moment uh, the carbon credit price goes around uh, $15 to $20, but it, we are expecting that to grow uh, as much as about 30 to 40 dollars. Uh, that means uh, we estimated uh, Sri Lanka can generate uh, minimum around 80 to 100 million uh, dollars per year. So almost a, a billion, billion dollar or uh, more. more more business in Sri Lanka if we really engage in this system. In this case we have to uh, contribute the, the Pongami tree general production in India like that type of thing. We have a biofuel uh, production, you know we have a a sugar factories, the, the by, by, byproduct uh, molasses can be converted into the ethanol and we have a caught up for example municipal waste uh, has been proposed to uh, uh, probably produce the ethanol again and so many bio uh, diesel or biofuel uh, generation and switching uh, uh, fuels like at the moment the tea factories and many industries are using uh, uh, furnace oil or diesel for, for generating heat. So, we can switch those uh, uh, fossil fuel generated uh, factories to uh, presidia or firewood and something like this. Also, we have a, a potential to generate uh, hydropower, which uh, avoid generating a fossil fuel based uh, power plant and so on. So, for the various sectors, other example is um, your transport sector. A large number of transport uh, fuel can be reduced by introducing efficiency vehicles and you know disciplining ourselves, including I mean you see the Colombo uh, driving habit is kind of terrible. So if you include some demand side management aspect, 
so you can reduce those also can be uh, converted into the carbon market okay but some say that this is like being paid for being good uh, but isn't isn't there some guilt money somewhere that is coming our way can one look at it that way panel yes i think you can because uh, i mean it's it's about being responsible but people are not we have to accept that many of our like you know it's uh, it's not something you know it's not something new to start with. if you look at historically we have been doing very good things you know to to make sure that we do things right but in recent Example? time I mean, even if you look at how we manage our water in the past, in the agriculture sector, for example, and how we used it and, and uh, how it contributed to keep it conserved when, during the times when we did not have water, uh, if you take an example. But now the situation has changed drastically. We, are, we think that uh, we are obliged to have this, but we don't need to com contribute to it. But a lot of attitudinal changes are needed if we are to really go into the right direction. Okay, we have a question here. Sir. My question is to Dr. Bhattagurda. Now you mentioned that uh, carbon fund is already established. Now I know that there are a lot of potential uh, CDM uh, uh, I mean, projects are available in this, especially in the state sector. So what type of assistance that uh, uh, those investors can get from the carbon fund? Quick answer, in please. fact, the carbon fund uh, established to provide all kind of support to engage in the carbon trading business. So a lot of companies, as you correctly mentioned, uh, they find difficult to finding uh, investment money or they find difficult to looking finding the buyers. So the carbon fund will engage with the banks to provide those companies engaged in the uh, which willing to engage in the carbon business. We can link with the bank to provide the financing necessary to uh, replacing the equipment and so on and so forth. And also, Carbon Fund uh, help the industries to find the buyers uh, from the Western countries to uh, to sell their credits. And the fund will definitely engage in all kind of activities, including providing uh, technical assistance and providing financing as well as the looking for the market. So, in a sense, the Carbon Fund is like a broker for a lot of small project projects eligible to trade their carbon. Precisely. What happened in Sri Lanka? The carbon credit projects are very small in compared to the international scales. So when you go to the international market, we should be a sizable scale should be there. What the fund does is the small projects in Sri Lanka will be bundled into together and make it a uh, scale up uh, to be viable in international business. Okay, we have a question here. Uh, well, I, uh, I personally think that CDM is a mechanism that the polluting world has come out to keep polluting by paying us to keep, uh, you know, keep, keep maintain the status quo. Just to, just to clarify, CDM means Clean Development, Development Mechanism. Mechanism, yes. yeah. So in a way, that's not going to help us in the long run. The kind of problems that we are facing, which you described in the first session, it's going to continue or aggravate if we, you know, just rely on the carbon CDM. I know it means this uh, uh, 3 million tons we have and we can get so much of money. But is it going to help us in the long run is a, is a, is a big question. Uh, secondly, I think uh, CDM, getting project, project approved through CDM is a, is, a, is a lengthy process and you need to rely on, on the, the foreign consultants and pay them, pay them to come and monitor. So which is at the end of the day, are we really looking at the carbon balance is a question I just want to ask. I, dis okay. I disagree with both two points, both because what happened is the, the, the criticism that the polluter will continue to pay and the pass in the uh, pollution to the developing country is wrong. But on the carbon credit scheme, the developed countries can trade only up to 80%, 20% of their uh, emission reductions. 80% has to reduce home the, uh, by themselves. Therefore, we, we can't pass entire thing to the developing countries. Second question about the consultancy fee and all. In the past, you are right, for, for building up a carbon project, it's about costly about 3 million rupees. So now, in the past, the, we rely on the foreign consultants. Now, we are developing local consultants available. We have, don't have to go for foreign consultants. Local capacity has been built. 
we, we shouldn't worry. Uh, there are capacities there. Just how long it does it take to get it? Oh, in the past, it, cost, it, it took about almost one year to complete the project. Seven. But now, if you try our best, we can finish by around four months to five months. Okay. There's another question. I think there's a lot of opportunity for Sri Lanka also to start community-based projects, which will help the community. Now, with some, some of these large projects, which mostly helps the company itself, the savings, the energy they get, right. for example, in remote areas where the grid connection is going to cost you a lot, you could depend on either solar energy or biogas, where the community itself could manage that. In fact, in uh, some of the, uh, in Pakistan, there is already a project that have started where the community is running the uh, micro hydro plant and they get, they, 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 because of that, there are also skills development take place in that area. Okay. So, after we establish a coal power generation plant, uh, will it affect the carbon trade uh, sector? No, when you have a coal, coal power plant, in according to the theory, our, our Sri Lanka will be benefited more, unfortunately. <laughs> but I mean, our, something called baseline, our average carbon emission factor will go up. Mm -hmm. So then we have a uh, <laughs> renewable plant, that means we are replacing our baseline. That means when the, with the uh, coal plant coming, our average emission will be go up, which is beneficial to Sri Lanka anyway. <laughs> Remember what we said in the video, it's <laughs> complex science, complex accounting. <laughs> Nothing is ever so simple, but we need, to, we need to take a break and let's return to find out what the smart technologies and solutions are for living with climate change. Welcome back to Sri Lanka 2048. We've been talking about living with global climate change. And at the beginning, we, we remarked that lifestyle changes are necessary, smart solutions are necessary. And we first look at a solution offered by a Sri Lankan company that might be a way forward. Let's take a look at this video. All plants, big and small, absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to grow. Through this, trees help reduce this greenhouse gas, which warms up our planet. We're visiting a mahogany plantation in the Ratnapura district. Most of these trees are still young. When fully grown, they will be harvested for their timber. This plantation is being run by a company called Touchwood Investments. They grow these commercially valuable trees as an investment for people. Investors share the profit when timber is harvested after 20 or more years. While the trees grow, they keep absorbing carbon dioxide. So the company sees opportunities to enter carbon trading schemes. For carbon trading, you need large extents. In Sri Lanka at the moment, we have about 1,500 acres. So uh, we are looking at uh, next year to plant about 1,000 acres. The mahogany plantation provides several benefits. The first is the global benefit of absorbing carbon dioxide. The other benefits are more local. Managed forests like this provide timber for commercial use, thus reducing pressures on natural forests. These trees also have a positive impact on the water, soil and air quality. The forest benefits rural communities by creating work and income earning opportunities. The mahogany plants are interspersed among other trees native to the area. There is a healthy undergrowth complete with creepers. Touchwood and other similar companies offer high returns on investment over a long period of time. By joining a formal carbon trading scheme, the company hopes that they will also be able to introduce a new form of financial rewards for their customers. The environmental benefit and the social benefits that uh, comes embedded with this investment, which I think uh, the conventional investment does not have that. Business as usual cannot continue. Lifestyles and businesses have both got to change. But how? Is this, is this the way to go? I believe our future 
is in making the growing of trees profitable, not just the felling. And uh, the, our rubber areas are an example of this. Now, the most sustainable agriculture is our, in our rubber area. They don't require any fertilizer. Why? What goes out of the rubber area? A hydrocarbon from the air. The hydrocarbon is, is what is exported, the, the, the rubber. They don't require any other input here except man's care. And which area of the country has no, had never had drought? Matugama. They don't have drought. Why? We say wet zone, but it was made wet by man. Fortunately, by keeping the, the old, uh, the, the natural forest there, the trees form a microclimate and form a natural forest there and regenerate it, like you all are showing. Uh, there's a natural microclimate and there's a recirculation there. And this is the way we can extend right through the dry zone. We have proved this in the, in the uh, Dadiam Polar area, barren hillsides uh, after tea was given to the, to, the, to, the, to the chena farmers. The chena covered all the tea. And now, you, when we try to find it, we can't find it. We grow trees there, tremendous trees of the salt program. You, we couldn't find the area. Recently, 10 years after we planted all the area, we went to find it. And would you believe it? We couldn't find it. Then a farmer said, Mon, Menna Mahatya. And we looked to see if it was lush green, and all the other hillsides were brown. So I asked him, May Hari to Vasta Patangatta Kaudada? He said, Mahatya? May Muru Yayatama then Kisi Doriakna. We can bring the rain back to the dry zone. We can be part of the solution. Oh, yes, yes. Sir, you have a question. Um, I think one of the other things that has to happen is the, the way the industry is run in this country has to dramatically change. There have been a lot of experimenting that is going on in the industry sector into what's called green buildings as well as green manufacturing processes. And that is already giving this country as a whole as a niche. And I think what has to happen is, uh, I agree all this green movement is very vital and has to happen. But unless we transform our industry, we will not have enough of an impact because it's the pollution of the industry that's partly reducing our rainfall, and it's them who's actually driving our <laughs> carbon emissions. Okay. Aren't we all part of the solution? Should we not take personal responsibility? I'd like a view on this from our audience. Where does individual responsibility and action begin? Yes? I actually have yeah, something related to it. Like, for an example, I've been very concerned about uh, efficient cars, but it's extremely expensive. Although I want to change my lifestyle, it's, it's cost prohibitive. For an example, he mentioned that industries should change. Middle, middle businessmen, where, where does a person have money in this country? And ironically, he mentioned, if we come up with the coal plant, our capacity or our ability to earn money through CDM will increase. So how about if I suggest, now Sri Lanka being a poor country, let's forget about this and just be rich somehow. And then we can, uh, we have the resilience to deal with any problem. That's an argument that just, needs just to be an discussed argument. and yeah. debated yeah. very widely. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, we don't, have, we don't have the time to do it here and now. And this argument, this debate is going to continue for a long time. Uh, our time is up, but I can very quickly uh, yeah. allow the panel to have a last word, if you like. Yeah. Actually, uh, very quickly, now if the climate change is going up, the, the research done here shows that the, the dry zone will going to be drier, wet zone going to be drier. We, both are disastrous. And what uh, Ray was saying is ideal. In this country, this beautiful country, there is no place that we cannot live and there is no place that we cannot grow. And therefore, we need to go in that direction. Whether we get CDM or not, ethically, you know, as a Sri Lankan, we should, you know, if there is money, we get it. Otherwise, we do the way that we have been doing. Positive thought. Climate change is the only issue I see at the, where everybody has to contribute. Not the government, not the private sector, the, the, the industry, whatever it is. So, unless everybody do something and unless everybody adjust themselves, we are in real trouble. Darshani. Yes. I think uh, I agree with both Dr. Sumatipal and uh, Dr. Bhattakoda. I think in each individual has a 
very high responsibility because we probably living in Colombo has uh, is using more energy, for example, than anybody. But we don't probably even think about it twice. Maybe it's time to start thinking. Uh, Certainly, I'm as much a carbon addict as uh, all anyway. of you are. Ray, we can do it ourselves. We have been too much influenced by the by the methods and ideas of free people outside the country. In this country, we've long had a history of conservation. Everything we do, we've got to conserve. Conservation in our agriculture, conservation in our forestry, not to cut and fell trees, but to conserve them. We have only 20,000 20, hectares of, of, of good forest left. We've got 300,000 acres of scrubland, and we can plant that up into beautiful tree crops, which will re yield not only fuel, fertility and rainfall. Okay, on that note, we, we need to wind up. We've only skimmed the subject today of climate change and how we live with it, cope with it. And what we hear very strongly from our panel and from our audience is that we need to consume less, we need to share more, and we need to live simply. And if we do that, maybe, maybe there will be a better future by the time the year 2048, 2048 turns up. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.